Well, I guess I've almost been in Belleville long enough to have Belleville stories. So um, here's a Belleville story. So last Christmas, just before Christmas, the choir did this wonderful cantata with a Celtic theme. And you can do that again if you like. Um, um, anyway, after the service, uh, George asked me if um, I would go over to St. Andrews that evening where they were doing the cantata again and say the same words, the same little message that I had on that Sunday. And I said I would, and so I went over to St. Andrews. And then at the appointed hour, I ascended into the pulpit over at St. Andrews. And as I started to look down into the congregation, and many of you have probably been there, it's a fairly large sanctuary, but at the back, just over the doors, there's this painting, or large, large painting of John Knox. And I'm standing in that pulpit, and I'm thinking to myself, his eyes are boring right into me. <laughs> and, um, you know, the reformer, John Knox, um, stalwart of the reform movement. And there was I, this little United Church lamb ascending into the Presbyterian pulpit. <laughs> and worse than that, a United Church lamb of Methodist roots. And if you know anything about um, Presbyterians and Methodists, they didn't actually see eye to eye theologically. So um, there was difficulty in forming this United Church of ours just because of that. But, um, and some of the Presbyterians stayed out, and that's why we have places like St. Andrews. But here I was, and John Knox, eyes just staring right at me. Suddenly, I was very pleased that my mother had been a Presbyterian. <laughs> And then I thought, well, maybe the fact that John Knox and I both went to the same divinity school at St. Mary's College and University of St. Andrews in Scotland, maybe that would be okay. And then I thought, <laughs> okay, and I've just, you know, I've just finished at Knox College, graduated from Knox College in Toronto, so maybe the ghost of John Knox would tolerate me a former Methodist and a United Church person in this Presbyterian pulpit. Well, that's my Belleville story. Um, but John Knox, he sided with the reformers in the 1540s. And uh, he was quite uh, up in, in the world and he worked with the reformers of, around uh, in, in the court of Edward VI in London. But when Mary Tudor came to the throne, England reverted to Catholicism. And John Knox and others fled to the continent, continental Europe. And Knox went, among other places, to Geneva. And there he met a fellow by the name of Jean Calvin. And uh, he and Calvin saw eye to eye. And Knox was very influenced by Calvin and the, what he was doing in Geneva. And he took those ideas back with him to Scotland in the 15, around 1555, and then again for, from 1560 until his death around 1572. And, um, and he was the person who spearheaded the whole Reformation movement in Scotland, in his native land. And uh, he was deemed to be largely responsible, although there were a few others involved in it, in the writing of the Scots Confession and uh, the Book of Discipline that would govern the Scottish Church for centuries. And like Calvin, he set up before everything else Scripture. They replaced the papacy essentially with Scripture and elders and they were thought of so highly that um, even Knox thought nothing of taking on the Queen, Mary, Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots, reduced her to tears at times 
and Knox and his ideas, they, they took hold in Scotland and they underwent great change there. There was this incredible reformation. Like other parts of the globe, it needed reformed and that's basically what the reformation is about. It's about change, reform, getting rid of some of the negatives of the past and, and restoring a, a, a better form of Christianity, of coming back to what Jesus Christ was about. Well, our lectionary passage today comes from Mark chapter 10, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the Reformation. At least on the surface, I found a few things in there that represent change and reform, and the things that they're suggesting uh, to be reformed there are people like you and me. Bartimaeus, he's sitting in Jericho at, as Jesus winds his way to Jerusalem, and he must have heard some things about Jesus, um, and when he heard that Jesus was walking by, he started to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And people were telling him to, shh, shh, louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And uh, he kept going. Now, I've been in Toronto when Wayne Gretzky has walked by. And Wayne Gretzky, he's like hockey royalty, right? And when he walks by, there's inevitably a buzz, and people want to meet him, people want his autograph, he's sought out. But there's another thing in Toronto, this thing called street people. And sometimes they can be difficult to deal with. Some of them are on the street by choice, some of them are there because they can't help it, some will have mental issues associated uh, and that's probably why they're on the street. And um, some of them will do strange things. I can, I can remember one time walking down the side of the street, one of the main streets, Bloor Street in Toronto, and there was this fellow on the other side of the street. And it looked like there's another one. I don't know why his eyes were boring right into me. And he started yelling and yelling. And I'm thinking, he can't be yelling at me. I'm just minding my own business. And, but he was looking at me and he was yelling and my... Feet got quicker, and um, I w wanted no more of this. Uh, off I went as fast as I could get away from his yells. Um, anyway, there we are. Jesus, he was in the hearts of the people, kind of like a, a Wayne Gretzky par excellence, coming down the street, and people want to see Jesus, and people want his autograph, and people want uh, him to do something for them, and... Over there, there's old blind Bartimaeus. And he's yelling at the top of his lungs like some of those street people in Toronto. And people are trying to hear Jesus. And they're saying to Bartimaeus, shh, shh, quiet. Important people, normal people want to hear what Jesus has to say. Be quiet, you silly old fool. And Bart cries out all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That's the type of scene that could very well play out in Toronto. I was interested to read the post of the United Church's new moderator, Richard Bott, this past Tuesday on the moderator's Facebook page. And he said this, Hey Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, how often do we tell you to be quiet? How often do we tell you to pipe down? How often do we tell you to shut up? Because we really don't want to hear your story. We really don't want to hear your need. We really don't want to be uncomfortable when we are forced to realize that the brokenness isn't yours, but ours. Hey, Jesus, Mary, son, Make us face ourselves, we pray. Make us shut up, we pray. Make us listen, we pray. And Bott suggested that we reform ourselves. 
change ourselves and allow ourselves to listen, sometimes at least, to people who are disenfranchised and marginalized and the blind beggars of life. They too, he says, have something to say. And if you're walking down the street and they're yelling at you, it's hard. But they too have something to say. Jesus stood still. Jesus heard him. And he said, call him over here. And they looked over at Bart. And they said, Bart, it's your lucky day. He wants to actually see you. And Bart jumps up throws his cloak aside, and off he goes. And I guess someone had to guide him. And he stood before Jesus, and Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, my teacher, my teacher, Rabuni. Same words that Mary said when Jesus, she found the, the, gardener, the one she thought was the gardener outside the tomb, Rabuni, my teacher. Uh, he says, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight. Now what a difference that made in Bartimaeus' life. He'd heard things, people all throughout Judea talking about Jesus and, and Jesus' power and healings. And for some reason, Bartimaeus believed he had faith that it could happen. Faith that, that Jesus could restore his sight. And, and so he yelled at the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And his faith, Jesus said, made him well. Now think about that. That's some sort of faith. That's a faith that changes things, reforms things, reforms life. And uh, faith, it, it's, it's tied to belief. Belief in God, belief that in Jesus, the power of God was at work. What does it say in Hebrews? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. One of our members said to me a few months ago, um, and unfortunately, he's ill, so I haven't been able to get out for a while. But he said to me a few months ago, he said, people today, and even people in the church, it seems, have forgotten about faith. And many of you are probably like me. I, I, I tend to be very reason-oriented and logic and rational. But... For some reason, and this is one of the things that allows me to be a minister, is I still leave room in the midst of that for unique things. Because I think if a person believes in God, you, if, if God is in your worldview, there should also be some sort of openness to God doing stuff, like working. Sometimes maybe even going against what's natural in the world. And that bit comes from belief. It comes from faith. And in Bartimaeus' case, his faith reformed him, transformed his life. And, you know, maybe we don't see those things happen every day, healings. But if we allow for God, shouldn't we allow for God to act do stuff. And maybe this passage is also asking that we reform our thoughts on God and have a greater view, a greater vision of God, a God who acts. And then we read this. Jesus told Bart, I'm calling him Bart. It's not Bart Simpson, but it's, it's maybe <laughs> close. Um, Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. And the transformation that occurred in Bart's life, the change that this made, 
was, was so substantial, um, immediately he regained his sight, sight and it says he followed them, he followed him, Jesus, on the way. And it, it's interesting here that we have, we know Bartimaeus' name. Now, I can't think at the moment of any other passage. There were a lot of healings in the New Testament. Like, I, 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 there may have been one or two, but I think Bartimaeus may be the only one whose name we actually know. And wonder why that is. Well, the transformation was so great in his life that Bartimaeus decided that he was going to follow Jesus on the way. And he was just filled with thankfulness and he wanted to follow. And they were, they were in Jericho. Now that's the last stop before Jerusalem and the Last Supper and the cross. So if you're thinking he's going to follow Jesus on the way, well, he didn't have long. It's just a few days at most. But you have to understand this phrase, the way. The way is, is like code language in the New Testament. The way was actually what Christians were called initially. They weren't called Christians. It was, like, I don't know how many years, 10 years later before they were called Christians. Um, they were called followers of the way. And maybe that phrase derived from Jesus himself. Remember, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I am the way. Um, remember Saul? When he was persecuting these people we eventually called Christians on behalf of the authorities in Jerusalem, he was going out to search for those who belonged to the way. And before... Felix, who was few after Pontius Pilate, the, uh, the procurator of that region. Uh, Felix, we read in Acts chapter 24, had a good knowledge of the way. So that's the, the name for people who were following Jesus at that time. And it seems that maybe we know Bartimaeus' name because... He became a follower of the way, and he was in that early community. And when they were, were telling stories about Jesus, they would tell the story. And they would say, this is the story of Bartimaeus. And yes, this is Bartimaeus. We know Bartimaeus. He's one of us. And uh, walks on the way. But what is this way? Many of you will know the Reverend Gary Magarell. Now, he has taken a few services here from time to time. Um, he sent out to some uh, other clergy on Tuesday this short BBC film. Um, and the, it was a very, very interesting little thing. It was just three and a half minutes long. And the film writer wondered in this if the Coptic priest that the film centered on had the absolutely worst commute to work in the world. And um, this fellow, Haile Selassie Kalsai, he had a two-hour walk to church every day. And if that wasn't enough, I, I wish you could see this, uh, this video. I may try to get it on the, face, the Eastminster Facebook so you can watch it. It's very meaningful. Um, anyway, it, uh, he had a two-hour... Uh, walk to church every day. And if that wasn't enough, the church itself was carved into a cliff. And just outside, it's in the Heralta Mountains in Ethiopia, and just outside the door of the church, there's a little step, and then there's a 250 meter drop. No parking lot at this church. <laughs> um, and um, I wonder who goes to it, but the priest does. And Haile Selassie, uh, his commute involved a good long walk. He started off every day at 4 a.m., helped his wife with some chores, and then at 6, he had what he called lunch with his wife, 6 a.m., and then uh, they, he went off to his work of ministry. The long walk, and then he was 
thankfully able to come up to that cliff another direction. So he was climbing up, but eventually he had one piece that he had to scale at least 10 meters cliff face to get to the door of the church. Oh, that was Eastminster, right? <laughs> Would you come? <laughs> anyway, he goes in, he says that he gets there around 9 a.m. each day, and he sits there until 6. And he spends that time with God. And he reads the holy books that are there. It's an ancient church with some very wonderful uh, paintings, and like cave-like paintings in it. And um, he sits there and communicates with God, and he shares his inner secrets and being with God, and he waits for God's enlightenment. And he said, the word of God is sweeter than honey. At 6 p.m. he leaves, and Haile Selassie goes back down the mountain, travels back to the village where he, he lives. And um, he was asked why he became a priest. And he said this, I like the priesthood, and I like going to my church. And then I bring everything I have learned about God, and I pass it on to the people in the village so that they can walk in the way of the Lord. And God's deeds are perfect. And I watched that short film. I, I had to watch it a couple of times with great interest because it says something very, very different than our perception of church. It says something very different maybe about our perception of the priesthood, about the Christian life, about faith. But it was just the way that Haile Selassie Kalsen would, would go to teach others that, that just grabbed me. He would spend time with God in order to teach others the way. And that's what Jesus was doing, pointing us toward the way. And for many of us, you know, we work in places that we interact with people that aren't exactly followers of the way, and we get pulled this way and that way. And it's good every once in a while to hear about the way. Because as Haile Selassie says, God's ways are perfect. And to allow those to reform us and help us to live as God would, as God would have us. And for those things, we need God. And we need Jesus. And we need the word all important things for the reformers. Because there is a way. And it's the way of life and the way to eternity. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we come again to you. We've heard words of reform. We hear about how we should treat others, the marginalized, We've heard about faith and perhaps expanding our faith in you and having greater ideas of God. And we've heard about the way, the way of Christ. It's a way that changes us. And we pray, O oh God, that, that each one gathered here, each one who listens to this message, would seek out that way and would find life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.